So earlier this year, I had the opportunity to travel to Northern Ireland. I saw a lot of cool places, a lot of cool landmarks, a lot of natural features, and of course, being a 3D artist, I was thinking, how can I make this? Or I wish I could photo scan this rock. But one feature in particular really caught my attention. It's called the Giant's Causeway. The Giant's Causeway is a basalt rock column feature. They actually started as cracks and then they formed into these columns as they got pushed up. Being a Blender user, I immediately thought, this is a Geometry Notes project. It's literally a geometric shape that it's repeatable, it's kind of the perfect environment to try to replicate procedurally, and of course everything was really inspiring. So when I got back, I thought, why don't I try to make the Giant's Causeway in 3D? I'm typically more of a visual effects person, but I thought this was a great opportunity to create a realistic environment and to try to avoid heuristics and symbolism and actually replicate exactly what I experienced when I was at the Causeway. So this video will be a little bit long-winded, but I want to go into a little bit about how I generated an environment, some tech textures and compositing, how I brought the final result to fruition. It's a perfect real world location to do that procedurally because again, it's repeating, it's geometric, it's pretty much the perfect natural feature to design this way. So this is what our scene looks like in 3D. This one big geometry nose piece and then several set pieces including the ocean and some rocks and even some sea foam. The thing that draws your attention is this 7 or 8 million vertex hexagon piece that represents the giant's causeway. Here's our geometry node tree for our giant's causeway piece. In the modifiers over here, we have a bevel and then a remesh added on top of our geometry nodes. The bevel is selectively applied. The remesh remeshes everything. You can see up close that it gives us this incorporation of all of these pieces into a coherent slab. With the remesh turned off, this is what our causeway looks like. And with our beveling turned off, this is what it looks like. The first thing I had to do is create some structure using a single mesh line and we're generating cylinders along that line. Those cylinders only have six vertices, so they are hexagons. Once we generate a line of pillars, I'm using this node group called row maker. The hexagon rows work sort of like brick laying. Each pillar exists in the gap between the two next pillars. We can actually type in a single number and have it generate that row of pillars. 56 rows times 62 pillars in each row. Once that's done, it's time to actually give our giant's causeway some displacement. These pillars are actually pushed up over time. So I started experimenting with the wave texture. The pillars are being scaled on the Z axis according to this wave texture. Now this spherical offset is meant to give our pillars that hero peak that you see in the center. You'll see on screen right now some of the references I used and that main peak is a central feature that I wanted to try to replicate. Moving the object uh, recalculates the proximity of the object and allows the pillars to actually scale according to their proximity and multiplying our proximity by the wave texture gives us this structure. You can actually do a lot with it in terms of changing the style and distribution of the waves. After our regular displacement I created coastal displacement these objects that give some slope to the coastline of our causeway. So I get to something called dull sum. What I meant by this is that I wanted to actually create some pillars that were more worn away than others. I separated out instances randomly. The ones that I did not separate out, I subdivided. And once we add things like remeshing, it'll create a convex shape that looks like it's been worn away by time and water. Now, the ones that we do not subdivide, we're bringing forward. We're using the top selection from our original cylinder geometry. By selecting only the tops, I'm going to create random divots. You can see from our reference imagery that very many of these pillars have worn away tops as if they're soup bowls, worn away by water sitting on the top. I take the tops of our pillars. I also separate out geometry randomly by island. Here are the tops of our pillars. Here are the ones we have left. Extrude and scale that top and we get something that looks like this. And that's our classic soup bowl that we're looking for. I join those tops back to the original pillar geometry and that gives us this, these pillars with soup bowls on top. We mentioned beveling only some pillars. A stored named attribute give us the ability to set our limit method as weight in the bevel modifier. That gives us the ability to toggle this bevel weighting only on some pillars. So notice merging by distance, very important so that we can sew the tops back onto the original pillars. Otherwise they'd be separate vertices. We get to generating rocks. I mean, this is a rock formation after all. It's a basalt rock column formation, but it still exists in nature. Pieces of debris, rocks that don't belong there and things like that. I thought I would generate some rocks and once it's remeshed, they'll blend in pretty nicely. I could selectively apply rocks on the upper layers. I distributed points on face, instance to points. I separate some of them out. I subdivide them again and 
then scale them randomly. It's still very simple. Once they are blended in and remeshed, you're not going to notice. This is just to give the indication that it's a natural structure with some chaos going on. We set our material and that's our geometry node set up. Once we apply remeshing, we get that nice smooth texture. You can see how those extra boulders are smushed into the geometry of pillars. This is our shader setup. There are several physical aspects that I tried to target when building this. If you can avoid heuristics and avoid symbolism in your art and consider the processes behind what you're looking at, I think that makes your art a lot stronger. I started off with a base texture and these from blenderkit.com. I took some of the blender kit textures, kit bashed a lot of them together with some other things, and I procedurally mapped and combined the procedural combination method and its procedural texturing method to an extent, but the textures are actual image textures. So here's what our base texture looks like, almost granite texture that I selected. I felt that it struck a good basalt texture. As we follow our diffuse channel, the first thing it encounters is this linear light mix node based on ambient occlusion and normal information. Here's what it looks like with the linear light applied. Here's our ambient occlusion node, and this is what that looks like. It's taking ambient occlusion from the model itself, so alcoves and things like that, combining it with this track normal texture is basically this normal texture right here. And then we have a noise texture here here. Noise texture with the contrast increase. Using this texture right here as the strength for that crack texture. Then we're running that normal map into the ambient occlusion and that's how we get those cracks but they don't appear everywhere. We drive the result of that ambient occlusion map into this texture over here. A moisture worn texture. It looks a little bit like moisture eroding the darker areas of our rock. I decided to add this to this. The results of our ambient occlusion plus crack normal texture and then we get this. So it's actually cutting away pieces of that dark color. So then we invert it, then I add that linear light which creates this acidic burn texture in our diffuse map. I drop the saturation by about 20%. The closer the rocks are to the water level, the darker they are because they're actually wet. So I wanted to honor that. I created a wet mask, took the object data from our texture coordinates, added a mapping node that lowered the level a little bit, created a noise texture, and then added that to our water level so that we break up that wet mask. So I invert it, multiply it on top top of our original diffuse, darker areas that represent water. You'll notice in our reference images that coral seems to grow on certain areas, separated out the pointiness using a geometry node, another noise texture, increased the contrast, and then multiplied it. Then I used this texture, increased the contrast so that we're just getting these points. I used the mask that we just made and I multiplied. And then I used that to actually mix between our main shader and this coral shader. The coating is useful to add some extra specularity. I used this lava flow texture. All of these are blended based on box projection and blending. Use that as our weight. For our roughness, you'll recall our wet mask. So we want to incorporate that with creating a new color ramp. You see this is not quite 100%. Subtract from our normal roughness map. Our normal roughness over here and this darker area where those rocks are in contact with water. It's also used to add some extra sheen. So that's the weighting for our sheet. When you combine all of that, you get this. You get a pretty convincing system. There are things that can be improved. But in general, I'm honoring specific physical features that you see in the real world. These cracks only exist in certain areas because of how we treated our crack normal. We'll talk a little bit more about some of these set pieces. These rocks are also geometry notes based, but they're very simple. And here's what that rock looks like with our shaders. For our water, the white principal shader is being driven by this metal texture. I use that as a mask to drive those little bits of foam that you see in the water. But we also have the tendrils of foam. It only occurs around other objects. So to get that, I'm using the sheen in our shader and I'm using ambient occlusion. I'm then setting the roughness of our sheen to this lava texture together. You get this very nice sort of tendril-like effect, tendrils of sand uh, near the basalt pillars. For these foam pieces over here, I'm using a screw modifier on a plane. I'm then displacing it and subdividing dividing and displacing it again. I'm using this curve to kind of draw it in. One thing that you'll notice is this effect that appears to be like a, a white caps on the water. I simply made these cubes. These cubes are simple fog shaders. One of them is over the central area of our scene. Since the sheen is proximity based because we're using ambient occlusion, it basically increases the sheen of the water around the perimeters of those invisible cubes. You can see what that looks like 
directly in the render preview. There's no geometry. You can see exactly what that looks like from above. Just those cubes being drawn in from the perspective of our camera. It actually looks like something. The physical starlight and atmosphere add-on. This is what I use when I don't need a 100% realistic HDR background. This allows me to judiciously control the angle of the lighting, the type of lighting. This is how I created a bunch of different looks for the same image. And now we arrive at the compositing stage using a compositor that has access to all of the different passes and any DCC for that matter. Doing compositing when you have access to all these passes is extremely rewarding. We have diffuse direct and indirect, a diffuse color, and then glossy, direct, and indirect ambient occlusion pass. Adding ambient occlusion back into your image, especially out of Blender Cycles, really adds a level of realism. I'm taking the ambient occlusion pass and I'm inverting it so that we get a illuminance mask that just shows us where the shadows might be. The only problem with this is that we have a white backdrop, so to get rid of that, I'm using the depth pass, mapping it, denoising it, and increasing the contrast again. We get this, combining it with the ambient occlusion pass to get this. So once you have this, uh, since you have the background black, you can use the is to add a little bit of darkness so that's what this looks like with the ambient occlusion to add a little bit of darkness into our image and here's what it looks like originally i'm then adding some mist to our scene based on the depth pass again i'm denoising it add a little bit of light blue to our scene i can top it on and off that's it off and here's what it looks like on added a simple vignette using an ellipse mask and a blur added some glare and some sharpening and a very light amount of lens distortion the lens distortion really adds an element of realism that really can't be ignored creating this chromatic aberration and slight lens distortion around the edges and here we are in Photoshop I added a pretty healthy helping of noise to make this look like some film grain I touched up the saturation of only certain channels on top of that I have a simple lookup table the same thing was done for all light angles that I rendered out I'm a fan of this one the most the overcast look it helps the realism of the foam which was a pain point for me so that is a bit about how I put together this giant causeway render and I think it's a pretty cool thing when you can experience a place and then use that experience to directly create a 3D environment and again this was kind of a perfect example because of how geometric it was. In the future I want to get back to my roots and do a little bit of visual effects on this channel. Uh, let me know you guys down in the comments uh, anything that you want to see in particular or things like that and any free time I have I think I'm going to put toward making more of these videos so just let me know.